I, I'm just not going to happen. I, I just enjoy worshiping the Lord, even though I don't sing well. I praise the Lord well. All right, you're turning with me. You know what book we're in for life on Sunday night. And so uh, when I finish this book, I'm retiring. Amen. So <laughs> we've been in this book for a while. We're only on chapter 9. Uh, but that's all right. We're digging in the Word of God. And, you know, the Bible says to study to show yourself approved unto God. O workman, it needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So here we are, Proverbs chapter 9. Last week, we talked about wisdom, right? We talked about how wisdom created uh, the world, and at the end of it, we concluded that wisdom is Jesus, right? We also concluded last week, the fool feeds on Good. Y'all come out the gate then, didn't you? Amen. The fool feeds on trash. Now, if you notice something, wisdom calls out in chapter 8. And then we come to chapter 9, and it's very interesting how chapter 9 begins. Solomon being the wisest man that ever lived that we know of because God imparted to him wisdom. He begins by saying, wisdom has built her house. She has carved its seven columns. She has prepared a great banquet, mixed the wine, and set the table. She has sent her servant to invite everyone to come. She calls out from the heights overlooking the city. Come in with me, she urges the simple. To those who like good judgment, she says, Come, eat my food, drink the wine. I have made. Leave your simple ways behind. Begin to live. Learn to use good judgment. Father, we ask you tonight, a long day, been a hot day. We ask you tonight to quicken our minds tonight. We ask you to give us wisdom. That's what we're here for. That's the reason we're studying the book of Proverbs. So we can be wiser. So we can Make better choices in life. We've all made choices we regret. I've made a bunch of them. As I begin to read and study the book of Proverbs, you've helped me to make better choices. Lord, would you bless our time together tonight? Refresh us. Help us to put our thinking caps on and anoint us so we can see things we normally wouldn't see, hear things we normally wouldn't be able to hear. In Jesus' name. Amen. Interesting. Wisdom has built her house. Wisdom has built her house. Now, we're looking back at chapter 8, right? So we think about it. We're taking all this into context, right? We don't want to just be one of those who grabs a verse over here or a verse over there. We're pulling this all into context. And so wisdom, we find, is Christ who created everything. And then we come to chapter 9. And it says, wisdom has built her house. Now, that could be twofold. That could be the fact that Jesus came and clothed himself in flesh. That he clothed himself in flesh. And we could go to Hebrews chapter 10 and see where he talks about that. And we see the Trinitarian language in between Jesus and the Father. And he says, I have come and I have taken on a body like you asked. So it could be that, and it could be the church. Phrase her is used here. So wisdom has built her house. And so wisdom builds the house of God. So either way, you're talking about the Word of God who became flesh, the Word of God who is the head of the church, right? And so wisdom has built her house and has carved its seven columns. Now think about it. Seven is the complete number. Seven is the number of perfection. What does that mean? Let's translate that together. Jesus is the head of the church. He's built the church. Its seven columns are perfect, and it'll never fall. Didn't he tell a parable about that? Building your house on the rock, the storms alive come, 
things happen and it's still standing at the end of end of time and so he's talking about the church here and so thus as we accept Christ into our life the Bible says in the book of James does any man like wisdom let him ask who let him ask the Lord the Lord giveth and upbraideth not that's the King James Version I'm sorry I read the King James so much that's the only thing I can ever quote but uh, it just simply means that he doesn't hold back at all when you would desire wisdom he will give you wisdom. So wisdom has built her house. Christ has built the church. And it's built in such a way that Jesus himself said, the gates of hell will never be able to destroy. You know, we're a part of something, folks, that's never going to be destroyed. We're a part of something that Christ started that's going to stand the test of time. It's called the church. We're open to all around the world with all kind of different locations. And the church is a neat thing. I often hear people say, well, the church is not perfect. And uh, that's bad theology. Because who's the head? Mm -hmm. Better think about what you're saying. Amen. You better think about what you're saying. Now, the people he invite, he's invited to come in, we need a little work. But the church itself that he built on the seven pillars is perfect in every way. Now notice she has prepared a great, great banquet. Let's fast forward. Don't y'all love connecting the Old Testament with the New Testament? I do. I just get fired up when I, when I find a, a connection there. How many of y'all remember Jesus telling a parable? about a great feast and he sent his servants out to invite everybody to come y'all remember that and man did they have some lame excuses i married a wife i can't come you better bring her on we amen Huh? Right, come on now i bought some land uh and i need to go look at it really boy you can tell who you're dealing with right there other guy said, I bought some oxen. I got to go prove them. Translate that. I got to go see if they can plow. Who does that? And all these excuses came in. But the key thing is, the church is built today, and Christ has prepared a great banquet for you and I. He's mixed the wine. That's the new wine that Peter talked about. Fast forward again to the day of Pentecost. They thought they was drunk. But Peter said, no, we're we dealing with the new wine. Amen. And he set the table. He set the table. Now, you go back into the Old Testament, you think about the, the tabernacle. You remember the table was set. What was on the table? The bread. The bread represents what? The Word of God. The lampstand was in there too as well by the table. What does that represent? The light of God. God set the table for us. What did David say in Psalm 23? Man, we're making a lot of connections tonight, aren't we? Thou set us a table. What do you remember that? Psalm 23. Thou set us a table for me, for my enemies, but my cup's running over. They wrote an old song years ago entitled, I don't know how many of y'all, I might, just had a flashback to a long time ago. Y'all ever heard that old song, Drinking from My Saucer? Because my cup's run over. Amen. I, I went way back there now. Somebody said, come on, Pastor. All right, now, <clears throat> I just had a flashback. He says, but now watch this. She has sent her servants. That's talking about the church. We go all the way through Acts, and we see people being sent. Paul and, and Silas being sent. Paul and Barnabas being sent. We see Timothy being sent. So she has sent her servants to invite everyone to come. That's exactly what happened in that parable, wasn't it? The people made excuses. How many people are making excuses? And not talking about coming to a church service. It's talking about coming to church. It's talking about coming where we can see and hear the power of God. David said in Psalm 63, Oh God, that I might see your glory as I have seen it in the sanctuary. Powerful services, folks. God at work in our midst. The eternal God 
has built something that we've been invited to come into. That's exciting to me. He has sent her servants to invite who? Predestination? No. Who? Everyone. How many? You know what everyone means in the Hebrew? Everyone. Amen. It means that in Greek. It means that in Eng any language. I don't know any I don't know a lot of language, but I would imagine any language in the world, everyone means everyone. It doesn't exclude anybody. And so everybody can come. Don't ever feel like you can't come. Don't ever feel like you're you're not worthy. You were worthy enough for Jesus to die on the cross for your sin. And so he calls to us. She calls out in the heights overlooking the city. Come in with me. See, the Holy Ghost is always calling us and moving us to come into the Trinitarian life of God. She urges the simple. We done talked about that word simple. I used to hear my grandma say, ah, that boy was very simple. She didn't tell me I was simple every once in a while. I just thought she meant I was country for a long time, like a redneck or something like that. But you know what that word simple actually means? Someone without understanding. Someone without understanding. I looked up the Hebrew uh, this afternoon when I was making preparation for this. And it means someone without understanding. You say, give me an example. Well, if I look back at my life, back when I was not saved, I live like somebody without understanding. Some of the things I, I did, I look back and I say, what was I thinking? And even in the Bible, we find people doing the same things. And so when it says calling to the simple, it's okay to be simple, but it's not okay to stay simple. Did I say that all right? Did I say that okay? It's all right, because we all come into this world simple. We all come in this world not knowing how to do anything. Somebody taught you how to dress. Somebody taught you how to eat. Somebody taught you how to go to the bathroom. That potty training is rough. Amen. I mean, that's the deal right there. I don't really care for that deal there. You know, but it seems like when I always keep them kids, I get the ones that's potty training. Amen. And I remember one time Cindy left, and, and she left me with them boys. She didn't leave me with them boys much. She didn't trust me, and she rightly so. Amen. But, uh. And, and I forget which one of them was potty trained. I guess it was the wee boy. And, man, he just, boy, I throw them pants away. I, she said, you can wash them off. I took him water hose and washed them off. Amen. Listen to me. Let me tell you all something. Somebody taught us everything. You can't look at somebody else and say, well, he knows more than I do. Look, we all come here. We all, what, I'm, what are you trying to say? I'm trying to say the Lord is calling to us all to give us wisdom. I know the Bible because I've read it. It didn't like all of a sudden God called me to preach and he downloaded all the scripture into my mind. You have to do the time, folks. God's calling you. And it's all right to be simple, but it's not all right to stay there. Come in with me, she urges, the simple. To those who like good judgment, she says, come eat my food. What food is it talking about? The word of God. The Word of God is considered as milk and is considered as meat. Drink the wine. What's the wine? The wine. People get tore up about that parable about Jesus turning the water into wine. Some people try to take that and make it into the fact that Jesus okay drinking and all kind of stuff like that. Here's the main thing of that parable. That might be a good verse after the verse. The main thing in that parable is Jesus brought in the good first. Remember he told the parable about the wineskins. You can't put new wine in old wineskins. Aren't y'all glad of that? Aren't you glad the Holy Ghost doesn't come into your life and leave you in your old state? You understand those parables? The new wine is the good wine. In that day and time, wine would sour sometimes. And... and and, and sometime wouldn't be good. And he says to you and I, I've set the table. 
and, and Paul, he hinged on that. He said, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with a spirit. Now, some of y'all might not understand what that means, but I've been in both places. Alcohol uh, uh, make you think you can do things you can't do. Amen. You, you can't reality. I went to jail one night because alcohol made me think some things that just wasn't right. Now, I'm going to leave it right there. But look here now. The Holy Spirit's the same way. The Holy Spirit influences us as well. The difference is He influences us in a good way. He empowers us to do things we can do. And so you can be under His influence or you can be under the influence of the world. And wisdom cries out, Come, eat the food of the Bible. Be filled with the Holy Ghost and be under the influence of the Spirit. On Pentecost, they were filled with the Spirit begin to speak in other languages and sharing the gospel. And they said, well, these guys is drunk. And Peter said, it's only the ninth hour. We're under the new wine. We're under the influence of the Holy Ghost. Guys, we need the influence of the Holy Spirit in our world today. That's not a giddy, goosebump feeling. I mean, it may bring that, and that's okay okay when you're in worship and you get those goosebumps or or you just you have a good feeling but the Holy Ghost is more than that he's more than an emotion he is a person who literally comes into your lap when you repent of your sins and begins to speak to your heart and he cries out come eat my food drink my wine then he calls us to repentance in verse 6 do you see it Leave your simple ways behind and begin to live. World's going wide open for sin. The world's going wide open to please self. But the Bible says and calls the simple to repent of their ways and leave them behind. And then you'll what? Begin to live. You'll begin to live. Think about the people in the Bible that begin to live when they walked away from their old life. Mary Magdalene. Seven demons was a prostitute. Jesus cast out the devils, and, and then he saved her, and she began to live. The woman at the well, been married five times, had a messed up life. Jesus waited on her. She got saved. She began to live. And we think life. The world thinks life is wound up in money, materialism. Where life is wound up in relationships. But the Bible says you'll leave your old simple ways and begin to follow the Lord. You'll begin to live. Think about Abraham. Abraham left his home and left his family and began to follow the Lord and he began to live. He began to live. The Bible's full of people. Rahab, another prostitute who hid the spies when they came to Jericho. She got saved and began to live. I'm going to sit down in heaven with them one day and hear the rest of the story. I'm going to say, Rahab, what did God do with you the rest of your life? Mary Magdalene, what did God do with you the rest of your life? Amen. There's a couple of guys in there. I'm going to talk to you as well. But in a way... Um, <clears throat> It's, it's an amazing thing. Leave your simple ways behind and begin to live. Learn to use good judgment. Now, last week, you remember our takeaway verse? The Lord has some things to tell you. You need to listen, right? Verse 32. My children, listen to me. For all who follow me, and my ways are joyful. Listen to my instructions and be wise. Don't ignore them. I got something to say to you. What's the takeaway this week? Learn to use good judgment. Look back at your life. Look at back at my life. Sometimes I didn't use good judgment. Sometimes I didn't use good judgment. It wasn't God's fault because he was trying to tell me to do something else. And I was just bullheaded enough to go ahead and do what I wanted to do. Y'all ever been there? Amen. Kind of like the guy on America's Funniest Video. And you're sitting there on your couch saying, he don't need to do that. 
that's not going to turn out good. And you say, why are you using that illustration? Because I think the Lord sits on his throne and says, he don't need to do that. That's not going to turn out good. But repentance is very important, folks. You always remember something. God cannot deliver you from anything you won't repent of. Repentance means I'm letting go of this. Repentance means, Jesus, I really do want to change. Repentance means that I'm going to turn from the way I've been living and the way I've been treating people and what I've been doing and the ways I've been looking for happiness. I'm going to turn to Jesus and start looking for it there. Leave your simple ways behind and begin to live. I love that. Learn to use good judgment. Now check out verse 7. Anyone who rebukes a mocker will get an insult in return. Anyone who corrects the wicked will get hurt. You need to listen to that. You say, well, wait a minute. We're not to get out there and witness? That's not what it's talking about. You say, wait a minute. Are we not to get out there and connect with people? Pastor, you're always trying to give us that connect card and get out here. It's not talking about that. Did you understand what it said? It didn't say witness. It said anyone who rebukes a mocker. Let me tell you the interpretation of Scripture, what I believe it's trying to say. There's no redemption in any of us. You can't change somebody else. You've got to let God take care of that. And when you start trying to change somebody else and you start trying to tell them all the things they're doing wrong, you're fixing to get an insult. That's not the way to witness. That's not the way to witness, folks. And what's going to happen is you're going to end up getting hurt. You're going to get your feelings hurt. You may get some other things. That's not, we're not here to rebuke one another, especially somebody in the world that's wicked. Now, we could rebuke one another in love. Paul talks about that. But in the context of this verse here, it's like me going out tonight and grabbing somebody and saying, Man, you're really messing up your life. You need to straighten up and get saved and start doing right. Do you understand? You can't change anybody. And that's not a good way to witness. We were at OMA about, well, about a month ago because we're going to be going this Tuesday over there. And we just kind of had an open discussion at the end of class. And some of them asked, said, what's the best way to witness? And, you know, the best way to me to witness is to tell somebody what Jesus has done for me that's non-confrontational i'm not telling you you need it here's what jesus has done for me so we need to hang on to that folks because you can't change anybody now you need to discipline your children and you need to to teach your children and train up your children but you still can't change your children you brought them in the world but you can't change them but you can pray for them and we got a blessing this past week. We, we always pray for our grandchildren, and we pray for our children still as well. And we got a call this week from our oldest grandson. And he said, I believe God is calling me to preach. Man, y'all ain't seen me a Saturday. I'm sure he had the phone out here. They know how Papa is. That he told me that because I was excited. He said, "You excited that he's called to preach? I am, but I'm excited more that he's seeking God about what he needs to do with his life. If he would have called me and told me just like his uncle Justin that he was going to be a doctor, I'd been just excited because that tells me they're sensitive to what God wants them to do." I don't want all 11 of them to be preachers. We won't never have a conversation in our home anymore. Uh, but, you know, so far that's two. Baylor feels like he may be called to missions, and now Jackson feeling like he may be called to preach. And so you rear children, you show them the way, but you don't ever go out and rebuke somebody and try to be the Holy Ghost. And I've seen people do that. I've seen people in services do that. I've never seen it here. I've seen people literally go get somebody and bring them down to the altar. You think that person is going to get anything? They don't want to be down there. Folks, you can't do that. 
you openly rebuke somebody, that's not the way God does things. And if God wants to do it that way, you need to let him do it, not you. Now, I'm going to move on, but I want you to understand that verse. It's interesting he put that verse in the middle of this, isn't it? It's almost like it's out of context. We're talking about wisdom building a house in this great banquet, and the Lord's calling us all to come to it, and it says, leave your simple ways, but hey, don't rebuke a marker. Interesting that marker, that's somebody mocking the gospel and mocking what God's doing. We have a lot of those today, and I know you see them on TV, and you're like, man, if I was there, I'd be telling them, I'd giving them a piece of my mind. Well, you better listen to this proverb right here and let God have it. Y'all hear me now? All right? Don't bother correcting the marker. They will only hate you, but correct the wise, and they will love you. Amen? I love my parents because they corrected me. Any godly person is going to love their parents for correcting them when they were growing up. We need to correct each other when we see each other in Rome. But there's a way to do that in love, not a rebuke. All right, instruct the wise, and they will be even what? Wiser. We want to be wise, amen? Teach the righteous, and they will learn even more. For the fear of the Lord is the foundation. What are we talking about building here? Wisdom is built or a house. What's it built on? Mm -hmm. Fear of the Lord is the foundation of wisdom. Now, some people have a problem with that because they grew up with a father that was abusive. And I want to deal with that a minute. I want to deal with that a minute. This fear that it's talking about here is not the fear that you have experienced from growing up with an abusive father. That's two different fears. This fear here is a reverence fear. This fear here is a reverence fear, that you fear the Lord and you reverence Him as the Lord of the world and hopefully the Lord of your life. To put this in context, I always feared my dad. Now, I didn't fear my dad that he was going to kick me out of the house. I didn't fear my dad that he was going to come in and beat me. I didn't fear my dad that he was ever going to come in and say, I don't love you. But I did fear him. He gave me that list of stuff I had to do. Amen. Now, if I didn't do the stuff on that list, I really wasn't looking forward to him coming home. Amen. You understand what I'm saying? There was a fear in my heart. Not that I was going to get kicked out of the house, but I knew I was going to be disciplined for what I had done. But every time that I did what he wanted me to do, I was excited when he come home. I could look him in the eye and say, Daddy, I got all that done and everything. And he, he said, all right, all right, good, good. Every time I didn't. My dad would tell me, he said, now look at me. I looked at him, said, look back down, amen. I would never want to look at him because I didn't do right. He said, look at me, son. I looked at him, and then I looked back down. He said, you didn't get all that work done. I said, no, sir, I didn't. I, and I, I got a couple of excuses. He said, I don't want to hear nothing of them, amen. That was a fear. But it wasn't a fear that he was going to hurt me. God wants you to fear him. Not with a fear that he's going to hurt you. God loves you. He does have discipline. What does it say in Hebrews? Those he loves, he disciplines. Fear of the Lord is the foundation of wisdom. Knowledge of the Holy One results in good judgment. Wisdom will multiply your days. How many of y'all like that? Wisdom will multiply your days and add years to your life. You know why? Because you won't do something stupid. Amen. Come on, let's get real. My uncle drank himself to death. I remember when we went to the funeral. I was a little kid. Drank himself to death at 40 some years old. It wasn't wise. People overdose every day. Not wise. But wisdom will multiply your days and add years to your life. But wait a minute. Here, I like benefits. Don't y'all like benefits? Here you go. If you become wise, you will be the one to benefit. 
So he, hey, he said, why should I read the Bible, Brother Hal? Well, here it is. You'll be the one to benefit. If you become wise, you will be the one to benefit. But if you scorn wisdom, you'll be the one to suffer. Simple as that, folks. What does it mean to scorn? I don't need the Bible. I know how to live my life. I don't need anybody to teach me the Bible. I know how to live my life. You push away God, you're going to be the one to suffer. That's right here in the Bible. But here's the good news. He's going to multiply your deeds. He's going to add years to your life. You're going to become wise, and you're going to benefit from it. But wisdom has built her house, but folly has come to tear it down. Takes a change here, doesn't it? The woman named Folly is brash. Now, again, this is not a literal human being. It's talking about being crazy with your life, being foolish with your life. Folly means foolishness. The woman named Folly is brash. She is ignorant and doesn't know it. There's a few people I've seen on TV like that. That'd probably be a good definition for a liberal. Let me tell you why. One minute they're talking about not separating children from their parents, and the next minute they're over there demanding an abortion. That's ignorant. That separates a mama from her baby. Do we understand that? People are ignorant with their lives. You say, you can't say that, brother. How the Bible says it right here. She is ignorant and doesn't know it. People are ignorant and they don't know it and they're on the highway going straight down the broad path to hell. And they're just living life. Living for the moment. That's not a way to live. That's what it's talking about. You know sin will confuse you. Sin's confused our country. You know at an abortion clinic, you can't stand out in front of it, even though it's public, public property? That's astounding to me. That's ignorance. Yet everywhere else, it's okay. But a friend of mine served in the military. Marine. He was in the first battalion that went in. In Baghdad. Arrested in Atlanta for trying to tell women about Jesus that was going in to have an abortion on public property. It's ignorant. We've done ignorant things because we've not looked to God for wisdom. We've done ignorant things in this country because we've not looked to God for wisdom. How many babies we've slaughtered in the name of a choice? Whose choice? Certainly wasn't a child. We may have killed somebody that God had given the plan and the cure for AIDS, cancer. I know we slaughtered a lot of preachers and missionaries. She sits in her doorway on the heights overlooking the city. She calls out to the men going by who are minding their own business. You know, that's sin, folks. You ever been just out minding your own business, having a good day, and all of a sudden temptation comes in like a flood? The same call comes. Do you notice that in verse 16? Let's make a Bible connection here. Look back at verse 4. Jesus says, come in with me. And sin and folly says in verse 16, come in with me. Who are you going to be a guest with? Remember, in the first part of the chapter, the call went out to, the guest, to be a guest and an invite to the house of God. But now here comes the call to go with folly. Here comes the call to go into sin. Come in with me, she urges the simple. Simple are called both times, remember? Early in the chapter, late in the chapter. 
To those who like good judgment, she says, stolen water is refreshing. Food eaten in secret tastes the best. The devil always tries to make sin look good. You've got to hide something. It's probably sin. Right? I remember when we used to go on visitation. Nobody wants you to visit them no more, so I don't put people under pressure no more. But... I can remember visiting people and knocking on the door, and it sounded like somebody got clean run over in the house. I mean, you know, I mean, like, like if, and then, whoa, 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 hey, brother, 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 you know, and never come to the door. Like, I ain't hear him inside the house. Amen. I was with Brother Gary Red one time. Some of y'all know him, and I said, Brother Red. We went, I was over there in Revival. We, <laughs> we get this. We was in, I was in Revival with him. We visited people, inviting them to Revival. You know, he's kind of brash, to say the least. But anyway, I said, Brother Red, that door is about to fall off. It's a screen door, and I could tell it about to fall off. I said, please don't knock on it so hard. And he knocked on the door, and it fell clean off in his hand. He was holding it when the lady come to the door. Y'all think she come to Revival. Amen. We went to an apartment complex. I said, don't knock on the door so hard. Everybody in the apartment, I, he knocked on this door, and the person in this apartment come outside. <laughs> Listen to me, folks. The call goes out. The call goes out. Are you going to come with Jesus, or are you going to go with sin? She calls out to the simple. The devil always tries to make sin look good, folks. Stolen water is refreshing. Food eaten in secret takes Taste the best. The problem is, we always reap what we sow. That's good news for the day. Bad news for the lost. You can always reap what you sow. Go after that stolen food. Let the devil convince you, well, that's all right. You know what always amazes me since it's just us here tonight? How did the children of Israel get out there in the wilderness? Some of them still had scars on their back where they had been beaten by the taskmasters as slaves, building stuff for Pharaoh. How do they get delivered and get out there in the desert and somebody comes up with a bright idea? Man, I remember the onions we used to eat. I think we need to go back to Egypt. Really? Really? I mean, that's ignorant and you don't know it. Right? That's what they said. You know why they said that? The devil is able, even when you get delivered out of something, to somehow make it look good again to you. And you know it ripped you off. You know it costs you. Sin says stolen water is refreshing food eaten in secret. Look at verse 18 as we close out tonight. But little do they know that the dead are there. Her guest, remember we're talking about guest, who you're a guest with? Her guest are in the depths of the grave. Woo! Uh, that's a pretty interesting way to end that chapter out. What's our assumption from this chapter tonight, class? I feel like we have a class on Sunday night. I don't ever really feel like I ever preach. I feel like we have a class. But what's, what's our conclusion from this? Well, Jesus has built the house. It's called the church. He set the table for you to come and dine. The devil and all his folly calling to you to come to his house trying to make it all look good but the dead are there and what did it say in the verse up there leave your simple ways and what live I want to live y'all and I'm not talking about exist y'all know there's a difference in living and existing I don't want to just exist I'm telling you, I want to live. Amen. And you know, even though life is hard sometimes, 
is still living when you're with Jesus because his house is made of seven pillars and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I'm glad I'm on a winning team. I'm glad that I serve a God that can. I'm glad tonight that my life is on the foundation of Jesus. And I'm not as smart as I need to be, but I sure ain't as dumb as I used to be. Are y'all all right? I may not be the sharpest knife in the drawer, but I ain't the dullest. Amen. I'm just going to let God just keep giving me wisdom. But let me tell you how it's going to come as we conclude tonight. Wisdom don't come from praying. You, you can ask God for wisdom, but you know what he's going to tell you? Pick this book up. Wisdom calls out to you tonight. That's our go-to verse. Remember our go-to verse? I got something to tell you. I think some of y'all thought about that when you got up this past week. I got something to tell you. I thought about it. I get up every morning for the Lord to tell me something. And I'm not talking about over here just listening. I'm talking about getting in the Word and letting God speak to me. <clears throat> I want to challenge you tonight to start reading a proverb every day. It's easy to keep up with where you're at. Just look at the date. A good day to start is the first. Read a proverb every day. I'll guarantee you you get smarter. I got that from my father-in-law. One of the smartest men I know. The curse of the body through dementia now. changed him it's not took that away from him hardly communicates with anybody anymore the other day I was sitting beside him in the living room he really hadn't said anything I was reading a book Bearing the World by Dr. Kinlaw and I looked at him and I said Jesus is amazing The Lord loves us more than we can imagine, doesn't he? He said, yes, he does. He read a proverb every day for as long as I can remember knowing him. I challenge you tonight to do that along with your other study. Along with your other study. Let God give you wisdom. Folly's calling to you. Don't answer. Answer the one who's built a house. Let him build your house. And then the gates of hell won't prevail against it. Against your marriage. Against your family. Father, tonight, I thank you that you built a house through Christ. I thank you that you have wisdom for us to help us make good decisions. Lord, we need to hear this proverb. There are a lot of people in our world that are ignorant and don't know it. They see things that contradict their own self. Father, I pray that you'd help people to begin to seek you. There's wisdom found in the Scripture. We don't want to understand everything we ever read, but we can understand more and more get a greater revelation of who you are. That's what I want, Lord. I want a greater revelation of who you are. I pray for everybody under the sound of my voice that this next week <clears throat> that they would get in your word. They read a proverb every day and then study somewhere else in your word. God, give us wisdom. Help us not to answer the call of folly. Help us to reach a lost and dying world that's ignorant. I don't mean that in a bad way. They're just ignorant. Headed to hell. Lost and undone. Help us bear the world to you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. I'm glad you were here tonight.